Hello and welcome to the Stringer Podcast number 32. It's the holidays. We've made it. Dill, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Clay. I see you dressed all festive today. You're in your onesie, footies and all. Didn't expect you to do it at the office, though. You have to be comfortable. <laughs> I like that. We're releasing this on a Monday, which is a little different than normal. Next week's going to be the same. You'll get a podcast on Monday just because of the holidays. We're trying to sneak it in there before you guys get too crazy. And then we'll return to our normal Tuesday release date after that. We have Tessa Bunum on the podcast for you this week, which is really exciting. Tessa and I worked together uh, when we were at Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment. She worked at Gold TV Canada, but you probably know her, you know, from the women's national team winning gold medal in Vancouver in 2010, maybe Battle of the Blades on CBC, or of course, where she is now at TSN. She's an absolute doll at TessaB25 on Twitter, at TessaB25 on Instagram. Before we get there, though, Dale, there's only one more weekend left in the year. That means one more chance to get out and shake your tail feathers in 2018. And we have quite a lineup for you this weekend. Friday, December 28th, Big Sugar playing at the Danforth Music Hall. Big Sugar. Big Sugar. There's a way back playback for you. 90s Canadian rock band. I've heard... Now, this isn't official. It's, I didn't see it written anywhere, but there might be some really interesting special guests that may or may not be at the show. Uh, there's a chance that I'll be there in a working capacity. Hopefully, we see something interesting. The only way you'll know, though, is if you're at the show. But I know what you're saying. Clay, it's the holidays. This is actually right before New Year's. How are we ever going to get tickets? Well, that's why we have our friends over at Seat Giant there to hook you up. Head on over to SeatGiant.com. Of course, use promo code STRINGER. Look up those sweet, sweet Big Sugar tickets. Oh, that's actually kind of funny. Sweet, sweet Big Sugar. Sweet, sweet. It should have been the name of their first album. I should have been their manager. I'm in the wrong business altogether. The Seat Giant will hook you up with those sweet, sweet Big Sugar tickets. And by using promo code STRINGER, you'll save yourself a couple dollars on checkout. Saturday, December 29th. We had the Saturday Showcase. We haven't promoted a comedy show in a while, so head on over to a new place called The Corner, which is roughly where that Much Music building is, Queen and John area, and they have shows at 7, 9, and 11 p.m. coming up this Saturday, December 29th. Saturday Showcase is a show with a variety of six headliner-worthy... Let me try that whole sentence again. Saturday Showcase is a show with a variety of six headliner-worthy comics on every show performing tight, 10-minute sets. Come see Toronto's best comedians all together in one show. There's going to be three shows, 7 p.m., 9 p.m., and 11 p.m. I feel like I said that already. Each with a different set of comics. Credits include Just for Laughs, JFL 42, CBC, Comedy Network, and more. Tickets are cheaper in advance, more at the door. That means heading on over to cornercomedy.com and reserving your seats ahead of time. So Friday, we got music. Saturday, we have comedy. Dill, what am I missing? Uh, 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 coffee? Coffee? Artistic endeavors? Maybe? I'm sending you on this one, Dill. Coffee and Canvas, 12 p.m., Sunday, December 30th, at the Fresh Paint Studio in the East End, 1849 Danforth Avenue. Come and paint freestyle in the studio and enjoy a coffee, tea, smoothie, and treat from our cafe. Just pay for your canvas size. Starting size is 11 by 14, and it's only $20.00. And then, obviously, sizes go up from there. A great way to spend quality time with family, like Dylan, or friends, like Dylan. Just relax, unwind, and create. You a good painter, Dill? Terrible. Come on. Stick figures is my (laughs) We're going to get you to work on it week after week, a little coffee and canvas, and hopefully by this time next year, you can give me something pretty hang in my office. You had me a coffee. Not going to happen. All right, guys. That's it. That's the last big weekend of 2018. Get on out there. Have yourself some fun. Remember, if you don't like our ideas, I completely understand, but you can do one of two things. You can either reach out to us on Twitter at Stringer Podcast or by email, events at thestringer.ca, and you can suggest what you're doing this weekend and we'll help promote it. Or always remember, you can head over to SeatGiant.com and find your own damn thing. Don't even need us. They've got everything from concerts, sporting events, theater, live shows, and comedy. They promote themselves as being for dwellers of cities big and small. They have something for everyone spread across our country and the United States. So head over to SeatGiant.com, use promo code STRINGER, and you can always save yourself a couple dollars on your next purchase. 
Enough from me. I talk way too much in these openings. Dill, we said we're going to try trimming it down. I'm speaking as fast as I can just so we can get everyone to Tessa Benum. Fitting this time of year, seeing as though everyone gathers around the TV this week to watch the World Juniors. She's someone that went through the Canadian hockey program, won a gold medal, uh, celebrated like a fucking rock star. And I was so, so happy to get her on because uh, I'm, I'm lucky to call her a friend and to have worked with her. She really is just an amazing human being. Tessa Benum coming right up. But Dill, you know, the holiday time wouldn't be the same without hearing from my favorite instrument. Can you guess what that is? Well, for the last time of 2018. Bring it! The sax. It's Christmas time, Dill! Oh, were you really? I didn't yeah, know you were why working. I kept showing up at the games. They're like, yeah, well, oh, so do you have friends that want to come? We got like three extra tickets. So I'm like, anyone want to yeah. come party and drink free? Yeah. First day. <laughs> so, like, bring like as many friends as you want. I'm like, okay. So, like, I you know who I am, right? I got a lot of friends. No. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to bring my three best party friends. So yeah. I'm like, guys, but where's this one thing? I probably can't drink, but come. Mm-hmm. They said, free food, whatever. You might have to buy your beer. I don't know. They're mm-hmm. like, cool. We show up. So I'm like, okay, so I have to go around and put, like, red dye because Redemption was best served red. So I'm walking around doing it, and one of the guys who was leading it was like, yo, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, my God, am I not supposed to put this in people's beer? And he's like, no, you are, but, like, where's yours? I'm like, am I allowed to drink on this job? He's like, you're supposed to. I'm like, well, fuck, this is the best job ever. (laughs) In that case, there's a waitress. Get it over yeah, so it's, then every time there was a game, I got mass texts from a bunch of my friends. Yeah. Hey, Yo, uh, you, can, you can I come? the game? Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you have an extra ticket? <laughs> okay, guys. That was a crazy night. That was, uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. It was cold, too. It was, see, what, I keep going back and forth with people. Which night was colder? The 2016 or 2017? I think 2016, where they, it was cold. Let's just we can just say it's cold. Yeah, we don't. I feel like once you once you pass a minus like yeah. three threshold, you're not doing well. Yeah. <laughs> Period. It's not nice out there. Outside. Yeah, yeah, and you're outside, <laughs> and the wind's coming off the water. Yeah. I remember. So 2016, when we went to penalty kicks, I was kind of huddled up in my spot yeah. because I was on that rubber just in front of the boards. Yeah. And I was okay, and the fans behind me were really, really nice. One gave me their scarf. Another one asked me if I wanted hot chocolate. I was like, no, I'm good, but well, thank yeah, you. I appreciate I do, it. But, I'm not gonna take but I can't. But it wasn't until I stood up for the PKs yeah. that I could feel the wind, wind come over the south stands. And then I was really cold, and then I was shaky. And then they lost. I know. And so now you're so. tired, and you have been sleep deprived for like 10 months. And. You're freezing cold, and, and you have nothing, and you have nothing. Yeah. And I'm complaining. Not that I should complain, because no, the guys felt it worse. But I remember going home, and, and they were still like, they had a room and a party for us still, because it was also the Christmas party yeah. that they had arranged for the same night. And they're like, still come, like everyone's going to come, still drop by, have some food. And I was like, no, I just want to sleep now. Yeah. Like, I'm just done. Sorry. Thanks. Thanks, but no thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. So, funny thing, I was doing a little bit of reading last night. I got home about 10 o'clock and I sat down on my couch and I'm flip open the laptop and I'm doing a little bit of reading, making sure I like, I don't mess up anything too bad today. And in the background, make up stuff if you screwed it up. Don't worry. I wouldn't, wouldn't, I wouldn't correct you. Yeah. Yeah? You should correct me though. It'd be fun. (laughs) So here I am, I'm, I'm kind of researching away, reading, reading and behind me, I'm like, oh shit, there's Tessa. You're on last night mm-hmm. on Sports Center, and I, I was like, "Oh, this is funny." And then I took you off mute, and I'm like, "Let's see what she has to say." I'm like, "Because what better source?" <laughs> and then you went into probably my favorite top ten I have ever seen torts. on torts. Die. My whole career in media has he keeps coming up in it, and it was like so perfect that you had a top ten just on like quotables out of him going off on media. The beautiful part about him is like. Sometimes he says stuff that's a little crass and harsh, but I've agreed with him one time, and that's when he said that the game doesn't have hate in it anymore. Mm -hmm. But then that kind of opened the door to me and opened my eyes a little bit to a little bit of a part about him where 
I respect it because he's so passionate. Do you know what I mean? Usually coaches are so, um, you know, non-emotional. Their face is just bland. Mm -hmm. Um, But not him. Like he, he actually eats, sleeps, breathes every play. And so when something goes wrong, like that face off play that Mm -hmm. sparked our top Mm -hmm. 10, um, he just can't help but be brutally honest. And I'd rather that from a coach than someone who's going to sugarcoat and give you the, you know, we gave it 110% like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in that part, I'd kind of turned a page on my, you know, I I thought he was a little bit uh, too much at first, but now I, I just see that's who he is and he can't help it. And good for him. He reminds me, uh, in Toronto, we had Pat Burns. Yeah. And, and it's that same kind of old school, I'm going to call it mentality, mm-hmm. where you're going to hop up and down and you're going to let the refs know what you think. And then you're going to let the media know what you think. Yeah. And then you let your players know, likely, behind closed doors, mm-hmm. what you think. And sports, to me, is two things. Yeah. One, it is this group of people at the height of, of human ability. Yeah. But on the other side, it's also entertainment. And I believe people like John Tortorella toe that line perfectly for all of us. Right. And gives us, you know, he leads these men that are at the top of human ability, and then they allow us to have something to talk about for the next few days until the next game comes up, and that's why I love the man. Tessa Benum on the podcast. <laughs> hey, I, I'm eventually, I'm going to get used to, like, announcing someone at the beginning, but Don't people know your voice. Like they, they just knew. They just they were just like, oh, I know who that is. And I don't know. I did. I hosted a radio show with Dart Guy. Toddy Tickles yeah. was uh, out of town. He was in L.A. for a Halloween party, and he forgot to tell uh, Dart Guy and, and Maz- Jason Mazaklo's his mm-hmm. name. He played goalie for my dad, so he'd called me. He's like, "Yo, I'm in a pinch. I really need you to come in and help me out." So I did, and I went in, and I started. This guy called in, and he was like, "I just got to say." You sound an awful lot like Andy Petrillo, which is great because Andy's really? a, yeah, Andy's a legend in the game. She's amazing at what she does. And I was like, do I really? And our sound guy was like, I don't know. I don't no. think so. <laughs> and I was like, maybe <laughs> I guess I do. So people might think I'm Andy off the top. I'm not sure. Funny story about Andy Petrillo. So myself, Andy, and John Bartlett yeah. all surrounded and were around the new market OPJHL team, the Hurricanes, no at way. the exact same time. And then... However many years later, to nine, ten years later, we're all with Leafs TV at the exact same time. And we thought that was that, that was pretty funny. That, that's the beautiful thing about this industry. You know, I always thought, you know, in sports, hockey in general, they always say, oh, you know, the hockey world, it's a small one. But it's like, so is the broadcasting world. Big you time. You cannot not run into somebody. No. There's less than a degree separation between everybody, which is real cool. And what the reason why I love it is because... I don't want to say everybody's forced to, but for the most part, you just don't burn bridges. You just treat mm. everybody properly yeah. and nice because you know eventually they're coming back around and they're going to be in your life in a year or two. As I was prepping and was doing it this morning, I was like, Dill, we have this little sound recorder. Do you know where it is? He's like, yeah, I think it's in a box somewhere. And he brought it in my office and I'm like skipping through interview, 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 interview. And I got to 2011 yeah. and there was a Nike training event something with kids 99 down, down at the docks oh right and and the first like okay so i'm here with tessa benum uh tessa and i i, I blew it um, off the top i don't know Did what you? i asked you i was like oh i know it i said something like this reminds me a lot of high school and fitness testing if you had to go back to fitness testing <laughs> in high school blah 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 like what would you absolutely kill at and uh was it the 12 minute mile I don't, or the twelve minute, uh, what is it? The the twelve minute where you run as many laps as you can, and we never had that one. Twelve minutes, you never had to no. do that. No, oh we just we, we we had beep until we barf, uh, like yeah, yeah. just back and forth yeah. and back and forth until you're done. Well. And and so we go from there. That was 2011. Then Battle of the Blades. Yeah. And so you was it shot out of MCC or did you just rehearse there? No, it was shot, it was shot out of there. Yeah. So. I was there every single day, and you were there every single day. I was day. still working. Really? You were My doing schedule, both? Yeah, I was playing. You were doing every, you were playing, of course. I was playing, course. training, doing Battle of the Blades, and working. So I literally lived at the MasterCard Center. MasterCard Center. Center. Yeah, Jeepers I would wake creepers. up and do my skill session at 7 a.m. for Team Canada. And then I would rinse quick, throw on spandex and a zip up and throw on my figure skates, walk across to the other rink, which was usually rink one, mm-hmm. do my two hours of on ice training and then we'd get off and I'd do an hour of off ice lift training with Dave and then I would take those skates off shower blow dry my hair go over and cover the Leafs practice so you were at Leafs TV already yeah in 2011 yep wow 
Mm-hmm. I don't know why I didn't remember that part. Andy That's Petrillo weird. left that year and went right. to uh, CBC. Mm-hmm. And then I would train the Seabs. and go, My either goodness. go play hockey in the evening or I'd fit in a meal once or twice. Where, where do you, when you search back, where does that come from? Your ability to just, first of all, wake up early, which is something I'm terrible at. Like I'm god awful at that. And then just apply yourself with the same level of of energy and emotion and talent for like 14 hours, go to bed and do it. Rinse, go to bed and do it again. Yeah. I think, gosh, as a, I started, I started dry land training, not lifting weights, dry land training, body weight, sprint work, all that stuff as a young kid when I was like 10, 11, 12. And I feel like, you know, often coaches or trainers will try and push you. They always Mm -hmm. lean on you. Not, I never had one that was in my face yelling. I always had ones that were encouraging. Mm -hmm. And I hated to lose. And so, you know, (laughs) I I hated losing. And so, like, you know, when coaches are like, okay, we're just going to warm up long, slow strides to the end of the ice. Don't go fast. It's not a race. Okay. It is, first of all. (laughs) I'm going to be first. And so my issue was, my issue, my, the way I'm (laughs) wired ever since I was a kid is that, you know, you're not going to be the first one to quit. And the other thing is, is like, you just have to do this. You have to do it. There's no way out. You have no choice. So yes, you're going to get up and you're going to be tired, but whatever, you can have a nap later or you can catch up on sleep later. And so it's just show up and get the job done. That's your job. And I feel like, you know, having gone through um, Ohio State training there, we had a my first year, Coach Thunder, I think his nickname was, was our drill sergeant of a of a fitness guy and he really hammered that home, but he had the utmost respect for me because the first day I walked in there, he was like, I'm going to make you guys want to quit and you're going to, you know, you're going to wave the white flag. And I looked at him, I was like, you're never going to get me to wave that white flag. And through my entire career, he never did. And from that moment, I think he had a little bit of respect for me Mm -hmm. because he would always throw a little extra on me. And I was, I was just like, nah, I'm not giving up. That's not in me. And so I feel like maybe I'm wired differently. Maybe athletes are wired differently. I don't know. But for myself, it was like, this is what you have. This is what's in your day. This is what you have to do. Get up and get it done and reward yourself at the end of the day. And usually I did with a nice cold one and <laughs> which is fine. You, you earn, you earn those, right? You're in those treats. So, um, and I think too, my, my dad growing up, I mean, he had ways of tricking me to do things. Mm-hmm. Um, I've told this story plenty before, but, um, as a kid, um, he knew in women's hockey, um, not a lot of, young ladies had good shots and he knew that if I wanted to, my skating was great. I could see the game properly, but I was small, so I needed a a good shot. So he set up my, uh, a shooting gallery in my backyard and he bought, went out and bought a hundred pucks. And so we left it there and he was like, okay, you can shoot whenever you want. And for a week, I didn't even touch it. I was in the front shooting basketball. Mm -hmm. I was playing soccer with my friends, hide and go see, kick the can baseball. And he was like, I thought hockey is what you love. I'm like, I do. I'm just playing. And he's like, well, go play in the backyard. So what he did was after dinner, he would say, okay, you can either wash the dishes or you can go outside and shoot a hundred pucks. And it was like, oh, well, hold on. I'm clearly going to go shoot a hundred pucks. A hundred percent. Dishes were my worst enemy. Well, then I became a teenager and I got a little bit of an attitude. So some days I'd be like, no, I'm just going to wash the dishes. And it would drive him (laughs) crazy. And I would go out there and shoot pucks anyways, because a lot of my guy friends that lived on my street loved that I had that shooting Mm -hmm. gallery. So we would, you know, okay, I bet you a dollar that I can hit the left top corner more than you can. And then you'd collect the guy's dollar and then you'd go to the Mm -hmm. corner store and get your treat. But... For the most part, my dad taught Sudbury me. Sudbury hustler over here. Totally. That's how we did. That's, that's how we roll. <laughs> so my dad taught me, you know, you got to put the work in. And when it was announced that Olympics, the women's uh, game was going to be in the Olympics, he literally, uh, we were picking up my pucks in the backyard and he said to me, you know, this is, this is an opportunity for young ladies now. Do you think maybe you would want to pursue this? Do you want to put the work in? And I said, yeah. And he, he stopped and like, I'll never forget, he looked me right in the eye and he was like, there's going to be a lot of sacrifice and hard work that goes into this. So if you don't want to do it, I'm not going to push you. You tell me if you want to do this and you tell me when you don't want to do it anymore. I was like, no, I want to do it. And I said that easily. And then when it came time when I had to do my fitness training or, you know, uh, go away on, on hockey tournaments or, you know, have a game that I really didn't want to play in because my friends were having a sleepover and a movie night. You know, I, I would sometimes cry to my dad, but he was like, this, listen, you can either be regular mm-hmm. and have these nights with your girlfriends all the time, or you can do something extraordinary and be in the Olympics. But I'm just going to let you know, you're not missing anything. I promise that you're not going to miss anything and that 
if you do achieve this goal, it'll be everything and your friends are going to support you and they're going to love you and you're going to have a million and one movie nights after and everything will be okay. And I trusted my dad and, and in all honesty, I lucked out with the greatest group of friends I could have ever asked for in my Sudbury friends and in my teammates at Ohio State and my life friends now here in Toronto um, that were always just so supportive and were just always there and were always cheering me on and you know they dropped me an email or an MSN messenger (laughs) really dating myself Uh, I'm like you're aging us Tess you're aging Um, us here you know just letting Uh me know that that, yeah (laughs) yeah That, uh, you know, they, they just always had my back and they always let me know that it was okay what I was doing and that, you know, they were always thinking of me and that, you know, even though I was on the road and maybe I hadn't seen or talked to them in a month that they were still there and they, they still had my back and were still cheering me on. So, I mean, call it an extended family. I definitely do. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that, you know, all of that encompassing helped me become the crazy weird individual that I am where I just get up and I get things done. Will Smith, uh, I don't want to call it a quote, but he, he told in an interview, like an anecdote. And he said, I've never been the most talented, which I a hundred percent would question him on because I think he's incredible. But he said, if you put me on a treadmill next to the guy and my two options were quit or die, he'd choose die. I'd die. He's like, you're, I'm not getting off that treadmill. I'm just not going to do it. And that reminds me of how you talk. Like, not that you're that extreme, but you're just like, no, nothing's going to get in my way between me and what I I need to do. And for me, I'm way better into the long hours of the night than I am starting early. But I find a calm and a simplicity when I know it's literally just putting one foot in front of the other. Right. It's just, you know what's in front of you. And I just tell myself, I need to do this, then this, then this, then this, then this, then I can sleep. Right. And it's just so simple and easy for me. Where, on the other hand, if you have everything, if you're like, I could do anything today, I'm like, I don't know what I want to do. Where would you, you wouldn't do anything because there's wouldn't. so many options, right? Right. I'm you like, need, you need the to do list. I need the to do list. Yeah. I, I We're need, the same. I need something to plow through. Yeah. And I don't need to finish. I won't feel tired. Like, whatever, you feel tired, but I won't feel tired in it Until because I just done. know my what my list is. Yeah. And then my reward is generally sleep or whatever it is at the end. Yeah. <laughs> Sleep, pizza, poutine. I know, I've been there. I've been there. <laughs> this was funny enough. We went through the interview in 2011. You said one of your treats to yourself was poutine. poutine. Yeah, yeah you're like, I can't have it all the time. But that's my treat for myself. That is my treat. Yeah. And I, I don't share. I <laughs> do not share. Keep your eyes on your own plate when I get poutine. Where out. where in the city offers a good poutine? Is there any anything you've come across? I haven't. Here. Um, I mean, you got your, your typical smokes, right? Mm-hmm. Anything late night. You got Poutinis. Ooh, um, I don't know that. Never been to Poutinis? No, it's, it's a great true. name, though. Great spot. Um, but I personally, I'll, I'll drive to Montreal to go to La Belle Province. Whoa. I've been there. A friend took me there, so actually. Good. But the, it's legit. To, to drive if there. You, you yeah. gotta ha- I don't like people that just put cheese. It's not cheese, first of all, and it's not gravy. It's cheese curds, <laughs> and it's sauce. You got to get it right. You know what I mean? And and just the traditional. I don't need the pulled pork. I don't need the bacon. I mean, I'll take it. Yeah, I'll take it too. I don't need it. I am with you on that. I am the traditional. And there's a place in my hometown, actually, Sudbury, called Jack's Diner. And they turn your home fries into breakfast poutine. Oh, boy. <sighs> right? You don't say no. And they, they say it every time. You're like, okay, hey, I'll only get it if they ask. Every time they ask. And it's like, well, now I gotta. You can't say that and not get it it's funny you said it's it, it, it's not cheese it's cheese curds it's yeah. not gravy it's sauce and then you bring up Sudbury because you remind me of something when I was going through getting ready last night yeah uh, I heard you make a comment about growing up in Sudbury and talking about camp it wasn't a cottage it was a camp yeah. and my mom grew up in Massey Okay, and nice. so we we drive through like Sudbury yeah. Espinola Webwood Massey <laughs> and then uh, so she had family there when we were growing up and there's La Cloche Lake, which is just south. Yeah. And so we'd go to camp at La Cloche Lake and, and everyone had caught, not everyone had cottages, but friends had cottages. Yeah. And I was like, and I heard you talk about Long Lake. I yeah. think it was that you guys had a camp on. 100%. I'm like, camp. I'm like, oh my goodness. I haven't heard that term <laughs> in probably 20 years. It's cause, and it made me so happy. Yeah. Well, I don't, I mean, everybody calls it camp, but when I hear cottage, I think of a beautiful home on a lake. 
that people only live in for a couple months of the year up in right. Canada, like up in the Muskokas. When I hear camp, it's like it's just where you're we go. bringing your old running shoes, a sweatshirt that has 20 holes in it, a couple burn marks from making s'mores, yeah. you know, nasty sweatpants and a bathing suit. That's it all you need. It still smells from last time we went to camp. Totally. A like, bar of soap and a bottle of Pert Plus <laughs> two-in-one and you're, you get, you're showering in the lake. You know, that's what going to camp is. That's what is. going to camp was. Totally. For me and my brothers, so I have two younger brothers, it always meant we, we create these wild like spy games because we had we were three kids no television no uh, like we had electricity but nothing like n- n- none of these camp. amenities that yeah. kids have these days and we had this whole force to ourselves and so we created these we, we called it spy versus spy which I'd later learned in life was already a thing yeah, that existed. That's okay. But we had all these like weird games with intricate rules, which I could probably not even follow now as an adult. <laughs> we are like, no, your foot wasn't on a stone, so you can't say you caught me. Yeah. Uh, try again, but I get 30 minutes to hide. Yeah, and build my... Do you guys build forts and stuff oh, out 100%. there? Yeah, that's the greatest. And camp is where you're supposed to get hurt. A that's cottage, where you learn A cottage things. is where you're not going to get hurt. You know, A camp is where you're supposed to w- see a bear walk right through your front yard and you're like whoa man look at that thing or like a fox is stealing your snacks that's what camp is it's back off fox it's my yeah but the dog. lake is beautiful and life Completely. is great and it's quiet and you know there's no cell phones that's what camp is to me i love even among friends now do you ever do the cell phone stack at, I, at brunch or at dinner so i do at my dinner parties okay. i have a cell phone jail and if Ooh. you want to check your phone you got to do a shot of tequila oh that's not fair because i'd want to because you're shot. getting a t- shot of tequila. I, I, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'd be like, oh, I just got to check my phone again. I think my mom's like, calling. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's my friend Steve. Dylan must be calling. I think yeah, that's him. I, sure. I, I hear it vibrating from yeah, over there. That's his vibrate. That's his ring. Yeah, I know it. definitely the Dylan vibrate. <laughs> uh, get that shot ready. Actually, I'm also going to check Twitter, so make it a double. Yeah. Thanks. That'd be great. No, you can only open one, so you can only open a message. Put it back. That's why I said make it a double. Right. I put it back and I pick it back up. I just so I really would, like tequila. You would just rid me of all my tequila. Oh. Well, then I would make you shoot something you don't like. Like, oh. do you like Jaeger? This is like, like to do the dishes. This is this what is it is. Dishes, this yeah. is the dishes. You'd be like anyone who checks their phone, they have to wash the dishes. I and gotta I say though, kudos to my friends, man. Rarely are their phones out unless like we're playing giant size Jenga or like you know someone singing. Then someone will will bring a phone out. But other than that, when we're together, it's just like. We don't really need social media or anything like that, nor do we want any part of what we're doing on social media. Because everyone media. you want to check up on is right there in front of you? Totally. You don't need to. You're like, oh, I wonder what Tess is doing tonight. She's sitting right she's in front She's right of me. there. Yeah. I don't need to check Instagram. Totally. To see how fun, how much fun she's having. Yeah. So, we, I don't know. That's I love that about my friends. When we go out, we do the stack. And, so and stack that's them. just, you stack them upside down, down. And uh, if someone feels they have to check their phone, they pick up the bill. Oh. Yeah. That's what it is. And I'm going to start doing that. It's great when you go out. No one checks their phone. You don't need and it. if they do, you just got a free dinner. And then you stop people from taking pictures of their food. Oh, <laughs> nothing. Help me through this. The dating game has changed completely. Yeah. I don't know how to respond to someone when I take them for a lovely dinner. And then they're like, oh, hold on a sec. I just want to take a picture of this food. Yeah. And in my mind, I am screaming. Yeah. Being like, this can never, we're never, I'm never going to see you again. Like, this can't happen. But at the same time, I want to be, ex- like, open yeah. to everyone's art. Because I believe everyone has their own art. I see it, it kills as, me. I see it as a young lady um, maybe taking a picture of her food and posting it to let everyone know she's out on a date. And maybe she's excited to be on the date with you. Yeah. See, I will not allow my brain to go there. And also, I mean, honestly, I, yeah, I, you food can't go out to dinner n- never and have not look there. around and see four or five people taking pictures. It drives pictures. me crazy. I do it sometimes only oh. when the food is mind-blowing, if I don't smash it all before I remember to take That's, I was going to say, the, the plate would be empty. <laughs> yeah. And then you're like, this plate was good. Yeah, man. You should have seen how good this food was. <laughs> <laughs> Can we start so posting those? Right empty plates, empty guys. Plates. You have no idea how good this was. Just I will. I'll send them to you. We'll I'll go back and forth. I'll yeah, completely. <laughs> oh my goodness, guys. If you're ever, you know, get the, the, the grill Branzino at whatever. It's unbelievable. Right. Empty plate. Empty plate. Like a little bit tonight. of gunk on the fork. Yeah. Just enough to make it look gross. <laughs> you're like, was that good? Was it? I don't one? know. That sauce looks like orange and green at the same uh, time. I love it. I'm going to bring you back for a sec. Mm. This is a really smooth segue. You ready for this? This yeah. is so... No, yeah. it was terrible. And this is probably something you're exhausted of talking about. 
So you don't have to talk about it. I just want to tell you, mm-hmm. in 2010, yeah. you and the gold, yep. you and your teammates become my lifelong heroes. Okay. So the celebration happens. There's beer and cigars on the ice. Yeah. And everyone in Canada that year could not be more proud uh, to be from this country, to wear our colors, mm-hmm. because you know we all sat at home wearing our jerseys and our hats and our mittens, even though we're inside, we're still wearing our mittens. Yeah. But for me, it was the first time I noticed any sort of difference in how people were treated. It was the first time for me I was like, wait, what? I'm like, you're going to give them shit yeah. for that? I'm like, but that's exactly what, have you never ever watched any hockey tournament ever? And in that moment... We hadn't met yet, but I, that's why I knew 100% who you were when we met at the Nike event right. and Battle of the Blades and worked together at MLSC because I I love I love people's ability to be true to who they are and, and to have fun, and I love the ability for everyone to be treated equally. Mm-hmm. I think it's not until I see something that is unfair that it ever comes to light. I think what happened with that was, first of all, I'm so happy it happened. Because we stayed in the newspaper all the way up until the men's final game. Usually our win would have been celebrated that one night, that one, the next day in the newspaper. And then all talks would have swapped over to the men's game. It wasn't the case. We were in the paper forever and it was all over the world. But I think that what happened was the American writer that decided to write the headline Mm -hmm. of those pictures made it negative, which is fine. And so every other news Gee, station... I wonder why he made it negative, yeah. American writer. Mm, scratch <laughs> my head on that one. Regardless, and I think every other news outlet is just so overworked and overwhelmed with everything that's going on in the Olympics that they just grab it and run with it. And um, it's funny because not a lot of people know this, but the cigars were actually purchased by my sister and my cousin Ryan. And they... <laughs> ma- <laughs> I was wondering, I'm like, uh, how loud am I going to be with this loud? No, that's amazing. Even better. That's incredible. They called a cigar shop the morning of the Olympic final and was like, hey, I'm looking for cigars. My sister's playing in the Olympic final for Team Canada. We want, you know, not like the big, fat, heavy cigars that you see old men smoking. We want like a legit badass cigar. You know, we wanted, she wanted this cool cigar, not too big, but thick enough to realize it's a cigar and the guy was like yeah yeah we got those in here come pick them up and she's like the thing is we're out all day can you have a delivery boy deliver them so the guy got his son to deliver two boxes of cigars with a cigar clipper and a, and two lighters to my sister in his backpack on his bike on the corner of the road right outside of the rink yeah. and exchanged money so she did a cigar deal before coming into the rink and I had no idea. And so after we won... And clippers didn't get picked up by a metal detector? I, Clearly not. They let her in. So after we won, I get back in the locker room going to grab a beer. And I see that there's two boxes of cigars in my stall. And I had no idea my sister had done this. And I see there's two boxes of cigars in my stall. And I was a party coordinator mm-hmm. on the team. I always organized our social gatherings yeah. and made sure everybody was It's a responsible fun. thing to do. Yeah. I think Being there always Cyprus, has to be someone. I felt like I had the most practice. And... <laughs> <laughs> That's why I went to Ohio State. And uh, so I'm like, oh, sick. You know, they're putting me in charge of these. Like, of course they would. Why yeah. wouldn't they give these to me? But I had no idea how to light a cigar. I'd never oh. I'd never lit one. I didn't know what the cigar okay. chopper yeah. was. And so I have the box and I turn around and who's there? Stephen Harper. And he's like, oh, would you look at that? I'm like, oh, Mr. Prime Minister, did you want one? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, okay. Can you just, and then you I'm just like, watch him. You don't ask him. To what to do? You just you watch him for a second. Well, no, like, he oh, grabbed it, or, or I grabbed one, and I go to hand it to him, and he looks at me, and I'm like, I'm not gonna lie, I have no idea what I'm doing. And he was like, All right, let me show you, and he did, and yeah. he showed me clip, how to clip, clip it, and he showed me how to light it, and he was like, Here, you can have that one. And I was like, No way, thanks, man. <laughs> so that was my moment. I remember being like, This is so cool, and I was like, Guys, who wants a cigar? I know how to do it now. <laughs> and for the most part, for Party the most part, no one really enjoyed. Like, I don't know who enjoys a cigar. Um, so they, half the time they weren't even lit. Like when right, we were right, out on right, the right, ice, right. no one's cigars. You're just like we gumming just, it. Yeah. You're like, ah, it's a thing in my mouth. Look at me. Badass, badass. Big time. And the other part about that story that I love is that all throughout the week, uh, the month actually, our, our, our tournament goes the entire month. I'd seen people with these really cool Canada <laughs> shutter shade glasses. Yeah. And I'm like, where'd you get those? Where'd you get those? Everyone's like this store. I'd go sold out, sold out, sold out. I'm like, man, I'm going to have to pay someone like a hundred bucks to get those glasses. This sucks. So what I did was every game, um, I would take, I, I, 
before going to Vancouver, I had packed up um, a bunch of old beat up practice sticks Mm -hmm. and I asked my trainer if we could bring them. And he said, sure. And after every, uh, before every game at the pregame skate, I would get all the girls to sign the stick after the game. I'd give, I'd go and grab the stick and give it away to some kid. And I figured that was just some cool thing. Another way to draw on another fan to, Mm -hmm. you know, love and follow women's hockey forever. And, uh, so on the final game, I was like, I'm going to pick someone real awesome to give this to some kid that's just decked out. And I'm standing on the line waiting to get my medal and I'm, t- I'm hugging Wick and she's telling me, she's like, you have no idea how amazing this is. Like winning gold is tough. Winning, winning, uh, defending gold is tougher, but winning gold and defending gold on home soil is damn near impossible. And we just did it. And as she's talking to me, I'm looking behind the U.S. bench <laughs> and I'm, I'm taking You're in like, what she's yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah. And there's a man there with the glasses on, like, yeah, like putting his arm up in the air, cheering me on, and his wife's clapping next to him, and I'm looking at him, and I like kind of push Wick away, and I'm like, yo, your glasses, I want them. And his wife looks at him, takes them off his face, and hucks Hucks them them. over. They land into the U.S. bench, and so Mark Johnson, a a U.S. coach, he had had recruited me to Wisconsin, which I respectfully declined. Um, I'm like, yo, can you grab those for me? And he's like, kind of gives me the side yeah, eye. Yeah. He's like, sure. Passes me the glasses. So I'm like, thank you. I'm like, one second. So I went back to the bench, got That's the sign sick. stick. Some poor kid didn't get it. I ended no. up giving it to the guy because I felt bad. <laughs> but then those glasses became notorious because it was me with those stupid glasses on, a cigar, a beer, and like <laughs> shooting the guns. And I remember waking up the next morning feeling not very great. No. And my great grandmother, who was 95 at the time, um, Ukrainian, came over and uh, she called me and she goes, Tasa is Baba Couch. <laughs> and my teammates love her. So we're all like in our lounge, just like trying to wolf back McDonald's, yeah. right? Just trying to feel better. And so I have her on speaker and everyone sits up and her word is the law, like what she says goes. And she would always call me after every game and let me know what she thought about who played well and whatnot. And everyone would listen. And she's like, Tasa, it's Baba Couch. I'm like, oh, hi, Baba. And she's like, oh, I saw you on the news. I saw your picture with the glasses. And I'm like, oh, did you? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, so? She's like, I just wanted to say. And we're all like, oh, man, we're in so much trouble. Baba Couch is going to kill us. She's going to rip into us here. And she goes, Good for you. Then I was like, listen, if my my 95-year-old grandma loves that, Completely. everyone else can go take a hike because what we did was way more classy, as far as I'm concerned, than any baseball celebration with the goggles on where they're spraying around. We didn't waste any booze, might I add? <laughs> not, I not a drip. Not, not one woman drip. dropped a drip of booze <laughs> on the ground. We consume that. We do not waste it, fellas. Um I just felt like it was just a classy celebration and it was us just out there enjoying our moment in the space where we were successful. We had given so much Mm -hmm. in that eight months um, that we spent together and I felt like that was our area and no one else really deserved to be in there with us, even though the media was. And Mm -hmm. I'm really glad that they did take those pictures Mm -hmm. because now I got some sweet pictures uh, in my bank. Yeah. And quite honestly, I'd do it again 20 times over And, and anywhere I go after that and anytime anyone brings it up. I've never heard a bad response from it. No. So I'm quite convinced it was just because of that one headline and news trying to make news out of it. But I had a friend who was living in London, uh, Katie I. Mackey. I went to school with her my whole life. And she sent me an email with the picture of the front page of the sports in London, England. And she said, is there a reason why you're on the front page of my sports section? What? Yeah. I was like, come on. And then my uncle Tim, his buddy, or my uncle Hector, his buddy had sent him a picture from Hawaii. And he was like, yo, is this your is this your niece? Like they, or does someone have the same name? Like, look at her rocking those glasses with the beer. And it was just like, well, yeah, that's her. So I was like, get them to mail. So I have, um, front page of the sports sections from all over the world with my stupid mug on it with those glasses and booze and a cigar. And it's like, cool. I'm probably never going to do that again unless I become like some crazy mass murderer or something, you know? Tessa. I would never. I'm a lover. I'm not a fighter. But but I'm just saying that that was cool. And it was a wicked moment for all of us. You know what I mean? And even when we get together and we talk about it, we always laugh about that. Like, we didn't know that was a big deal. We just wanted to go party. That's what it is, right? And after the men won, I had Nash message me. I had Shea Weber message me. They're all like, yo, where'd you guys get those cigars? Like, how come Hockey Canada didn't get us any? I was like, it wasn't. It was my sister. It was my sis. It wasn't wasn't Hockey Canada. They were like, oh. Okay, well, cool. Thanks. It's like, oh. Props to Brit. Yeah. You she should. brings the noise. Brit knows how to get it done. <laughs> it's funny that you don't forget the men's game 
I think because of how subdued it like everyone was waiting there's like oh did it go oh it, it did go and then everyone realizes and then there's like that delayed reaction mm-hmm. so you remember it for that but the peak of my 2010 olympics was the women's gold medal win and just in my way in toronto 2000 miles away mm. feeling like i was celebrating with you That's and cool. and i never forgot that and so you go in so that's 2010 you go into 2011 uh, I conduct my first interview with you, yeah. and I'm thinking about that the whole time. And then I think you were with the Furies, and you did an event. Well, Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment and the CWHL, yeah. or the Furies, had a partnership. Correct. And I remember you did an event in which I interviewed you again at the Marley's game, and it was like some sort of meet oh, yeah. and greet uh, with a bunch of fans. And I saw these two girls that were waist height, and like over the moon excited to meet you (laughs) and then so then i see you know because we all have our own interpretation our own idea of what someone means to us or what's what someone has done means to us but then i see how perfectly it transcends and and works down and i was like happy again and then we spend 2014 or whatever on the road with tfc yeah and things were like cool and i'm like i'm legit balling out with the coolest person in the world right now <laughs> who I've respected for like four years and she's just a real human yeah like she's just cool man you know what the thing is is I'm I'm a small northern Ontario girl I always will be the one thing that stuck with me was um growing up Geraldine Heaney was the only female hockey player that played the way I did very offensive defense was you know second on the priority list and she had actually come to Sudbury Uh, My dad got her to come to Sudbury and um, work at his hockey school. And I'll never forget, um, you know, she was my idol. I expected, I don't know what I expected. I, I, you know, when you you have this ideal vision of somebody and what Mm -hmm. they're going to be like, in my mind, she walked on water. She was perfect. She probably ate with like golden cutlery. And when she came, just the I perfect just remember, amount. She knows actually. Her body knows yeah. how many calories she's taken in totally. at any given moment. Just this magical human, she's you perfect. know, that rode in on a unicorn or something. And <laughs> I remember how cool and laid back she was. And she was just like, Yo, what's up? Here, you want to wear my silver medal from 98? Put it on. And I remember being like, Yo, you're so chill and so cool. And what stuck out to me was Geraldine Heaney was just being Geraldine Heaney. She wasn't trying to put on this act that she was anything special or better than anyone. And I remember my dad was like, well, well, I want to take you out the last night for dinner. Where do you want to go? And she was like, I saw there was a Doug Gilmore bar down the street. You want to go there and eat some wings? And my dad was like, yes. And so we went out and... We have a standing reservation there. Yeah. We went out there and I'll never forget this because she ordered her wings and then she was like, and um, just a pitcher of Coors Light's great. Or Bud Light, I can't remember what she ordered. And the lady was like, yeah, sure. And then, so, uh, move over to me. I order my wings. My dad orders his wings. And the girl goes to walk away. And Geraldine goes, oh, am I the only one drinking? (laughs) And my dad goes, what? I thought you ordered a pitcher. And she's like, oh, yeah, okay, I'll share. (laughs) And my dad was like, no, this is amazing. I will, you. Never change. Pitcher with one. Do your thing. And so I remember being like. She's so cool, man. Like, who does that? Yeah. And, I, and I was like 13 at the time, maybe. And I remember when she left, just thinking like, you know, I had the Canadian roster taped up on my mirror and I had her name highlighted or height and her weight. And I remember thinking if I could grow as tall as she is and if mm-hmm. I could gain that much weight and be that strong and, and have that much muscle, then maybe I'll get a chance. And just going through it, Um, you know, people are like, oh, you know, the fame, which it isn't even really fame. It's just, you know, people start paying more attention to ridiculous things that you're Mm -hmm. doing when all you're just doing is being you. And Mm -hmm. I remember thinking to myself, just stay true to yourself. You know, that's the biggest part of this. Like who said you're so special? No one just go about your business and be you don't hurt anybody. Mm -hmm. Be a nice human because that's all we're meant to do here is just be Be supportive and help each other and be good people. And I feel like the group that I came up with within the program were also like that. I mean, Exhibit A, Jillian Apps, granddaughter of the legendary Syl Apps. Her father, Syl Jr., played in the NHL as well. And here she is donning that name. But you'd never know it with with Jill. She was just so chill, so laid back, so awesome. So I feel like, you know, I I didn't come up around all these prima donnas. Uh, My parents never 
made me think any differently of myself. You know, if anything, my, my mom probably would have backhanded me if I would have acted any kind of special and as would my grandmother and both of them actually. And so I feel like that's the coolest and I'm going to totally, I, I'm not doing this to name drop or to feel extra special, but my uncle Tim plays in the beach boys. He played in the monkeys and he, I I was wondering, I was thinking of bringing it up all the time, man. I know. And like crazy. And, but when he comes out, like when he's in the city, he'll come out and have dinner and party with my friends and never mention a word about Mm -hmm. it, about all the places in the world he's been, about all the amazing things he's seen and done. And it's like, why? Yeah. You know, he's Tim. His job, what he does, doesn't define him. Mm-hmm. Who he is defines him, and he chooses to live that way. So I think I was raised around proper people, and I was lucky to be um, going through the program around wicked awesome people. And I was lucky to have had Geraldine Heaney come to Sudbury and order a pitcher of beer to herself and a basket of wings, and to sit there and to see that happen. You know, I I just think that all of those things were guiding me down this path to just remind myself to stay humble and just be kind. <laughs> Tim McGraw. Is that Tim McGraw's right? song? Yeah, it's totally Tim McGraw. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I'm not going to argue with you because you're wearing plaid. Yeah. <laughs> totally Canadian right now, eh? Oh, I man. love it. And it's I said, eh? Eh? Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, a, a boot. A boot. How to boot it. How is the move to broadcasting for Hard. You? I so hard. would only imagine because great people make it look easy. Yeah. Those, right? You look at me and you're like, oh yeah, my goodness, jerks. you just have to go up there and talk. <laughs> yeah. That's all you got to do is you got to talk. How hard is talking? Uh, that's what I thought. You know, when Leafs TV, uh, Chris Hebb came over and asked me, um, you know, Andy Petrillo's leaving, you want to come in and do this? And I was like, yeah, I mean, it's talking hockey. I talk hockey every day. I mean, this can't be that hard. And uh, it it is. It was. Um, it still is some days and it's something about that red light on that camera that ruins mm-hmm. everything, you know, and something about a microphone because before interviews, I, I'll stand and shoot the shit with anybody mm-hmm. and they'll be so fun and, um, you know, laid back and easy going. And then, you know, I'll roll into my first question and all of a sudden it's like they're standing properly. Their yeah. hands are to their side. They're not breathing. You can see a little glistening of sweat and yeah. it's like. It's just you and me. Yeah. Like, don't look at anything else. It's just you and me. And I feel like it took a while to get used to that. And I remember Mark Askin, love that guy. Yeah. He's had my back and he's made sure he's cracked the whip with me a million times. He actually gave me probably the best advice in my entire career. And it was the six P's. Proper preparation prevents, prevents piss poor performance. performance. I know. And he's right. We grew up on the same, same rule Same teacher. Here. Totally. Yeah. And he's right because... You know, there's no such thing as over preparing. No. You always have that nugget in your back pocket if you don't use it. And if you don't use it, the viewers don't know what they missed. So it doesn't matter. But the second you're ever in that situation where you wish you would have read just a little bit more or looked up just one more stat and you're sitting there on camera oh, and there's that damn. awkward 10 second pause because you have no idea what to say. <laughs> so, uh, doing totally. And how you're about stumbling the Jays? Fi- yeah. Yeah. And, and it, all it takes is one. And then you're like, I'm never letting that happen no. to me ever again. And I mean, I feel like I've, I've lived and died by that, but he, he had told me it's going to take you long, a really long time for you to find yourself on TV. And I was like, what do you mean find myself? He's like, until you can be Tessa yeah. on TV. And I, I remember the day it happened. My mom called, I was on sports center. I was really struggling to find myself on sports center. A lot of moving parts on that show that people don't realize it's, it's a much more difficult show than people give it credit for. You make it look so easy though. We took a, well, how many years I've been working there? It took a real long time, man. <laughs> and, uh, I had worked one night and I don't know what changed. I, I, I honestly can't tell you what changed. I just went up there on set and I just, I was working with Nabil mm-hmm. or was it Gurdip? One of the two, two of my favorite guys to work with. Mm-hmm. Love those guys. Uh, unfortunately, I don't get to work with Gurdip anymore, but, um, and I was just having fun. We were we were laughing. We were joking around. We were we were bouncing off of each other on highlight packs. And in the morning, I woke up. My mom PVRs all my shows because she's a super a proud, supportive mom. Yeah. And uh, she'd call me in the morning, and she was like, "I finally saw you on TV," is what she said. Right. And she saw her daughter. I, yeah, I not, saw you. Not the person that looks like her daughter. Correct. Trying to, trying to, be a, to survive an anchor. Yeah, trying to keep her her head above water. <laughs> that went away. And I said, 
I don't know what it is, mom, but I found it. And mm-hmm. she was like, good, don't lose it because that's the best show I've ever seen you do. And I was just like, cool. I finally got there. Yeah. And I talked to Cassie Campbell and I was like, I finally got there, man. Like I was so pumped because we had talked about it earlier and she, she said it took her six years. And I can't imagine she grew up on Hockey Night in Canada, the biggest broadcast, 5.6 million viewers on average every Saturday. She grew up on camera. Mm-hmm. It took her six years to finally feel comfortable. Six years of 5 million people looking at her. No, thanks. No, thank you. I'm glad I had our 70,000 viewers on Leafs TV watch me struggle and fight my way through, you know, stumbling on my questions, anything like that. And then swap over to, you know, Sports Center and really hack up that show beyond what it deserved. You are very hard on yourself, which I believe probably dates back all through your sports career as well. And I'm still not content with my performances. I still want to be better. Which is great. Yeah. Because I think we should all strive to be better. Totally. Uh, I, I want to say though, you were very good on camera and it's, you probably notice this more and maybe you don't, I don't know. Maybe I just think I'm smarter than everybody. Um, (laughs) maybe you are when you've been in it for a certain period of time, you can start identifying people who are green, right? You can see certain things they do. Yeah. Um, but then you can always see things in people. You're like, oh my goodness. But when she works through all of this stuff that everyone has to work through, yeah. which is just being, for me, you said the red light. For me, it's the hollowness of what a camera looks like. Yeah. It's not an eye. You need an eye. Yeah. I need an eye. And so it wasn't for me until I started treating it like an eye yeah. and kind of like ducking and dodging around it and playing with it a little bit like I would in conversation with someone else that it didn't feel so like endless and hollow. Right. But everyone's going to work through that part because that's just reps and yeah. time and feeling comfortable. But you see these little things in people and you're like, oh my goodness. When they figure out the other stuff, which they will, this is so awesome and they're going to be so great because of this. Right. Or because like you have, not only are you just so comfortable in your own skin and you have been ever since I first met you, but you you have this very effortless sense of humor and that, that well that's why you said you know you were on that's the locker set. room banter that's the locker room but that's yeah. sports for me it's having two brothers yeah i think just creates for us nothing was worth holding back a laugh right like if we thought something funny we, we have to say it yeah and then it's kind of a challenge to see you know throughout the day or whatever and we still do that and we might say something outrageous and it bombs terribly <laughs> But it'll come back. It's you're always hoping for the bigger laugh. Yeah. And you're so good that way. And you're so smooth and calm and and everything. You just it, it comes out of your mouth. And I want to chuckle along with you. And when you're on Sports Center, I want to chuckle along with you. And you bring people into your world. Yeah. Right. And Thanks. you don't you don't talk to them. You're not just like, and this is the news for today. Yeah. The least one <laughs> again. <laughs> Big surprise. Yeah. Um, just, I just want to make this clear to everybody out there. I did not pay him to say any of this. This is just you being nice to me. And well, I really appreciate that. We Thank had, you. I had the fortune of working with you for how long? You're at Leafs TV for a few years. Four years, I think. Three oh, years? Three, three and a half years, yeah. And you cover all three sports, mm-hmm. which was, I think, incredible well, training. Hockey and soccer were my were my were my things. But you did I I'm pretty you did Raptors pregame, didn't you, on the desk? No. I lied. I wanted to. Uh, I thought you did. No, uh, I wanted to. I was I was never given that opportunity because should have. I was like a closet Raptors fan. Not that I had to be a closet Raptors <laughs> fan, but like I like I can't basketball, tell you know? And like Canada, I, I'm a hockey player. I can't I, tell anyone I like basketball. I feel like back then, you know, Basketball wasn't really as big as it is now. We know we the North wasn't around. People kind of went to games. It was like I like going to the games because the tickets weren't expensive yet, and it was like the most wicked atmosphere to go to. So I was like, God, I, I I want them to be good, but I don't want them to be popular because I want these cheap tickets. Still, it's like going to uh, the Toronto Rock Games. Great price on tickets. What an atmosphere! Wicked entertainment. Why wouldn't you go there? Those guys are crazy, though. And they, they work full-time jobs. They're firefighters. Like, these guys are legit badass, and they're awesome, and the atmosphere is great. And every time I go in there, it's like, why aren't there more people here? Yeah. Do you know they, what I they mean? They haven't figured it out no yet. No one's figured it out. It's the secret in the city, and I blew it, obviously, by saying it on here. Whoops. Now everyone's <laughs> going to go. Crap. You brought up We the North. Is We the North as big without the 2010 Olympics? Is we the North as big without the 2010 Olympics because it played off that pride? It did. That I believe we found, we truly found in 2010 when we became the most winningest winningest country, yeah, ever in in uh, a Winter Olympics th- on home soil. 
I think it reinvigorized it. I think it right. reminded people, hey, you know, it's Remember okay. This? And I think Toronto also wants to not only represent Toronto, it wants to represent all of Canada. And I think that that was the team's way of letting everyone know across Canada, like, you're proud of Canada? No, we are Canada. Yeah. We are representing you guys. Like, don't forget that. And I think that that's, that's pretty darn cool and a great marketing marketing scheme. On their I, part. I, it was funny because Tim Lewicki was in charge, and I am a massive fan of Tim's. Yep. And I was before when he was at AAG and yep. since he left. And, uh, and that wasn't supposed to go out yet. That really? was that was going to be saved, I believe, for the f- beginning of the following season. Wow! And that was the, that was the year. I might be wrong. I don't think I am. But that was the year where at Christmas they were terrible. Yeah. Uh, they traded Rudy Gay. Yeah. For like four great locker room guys, uh, which says a bit about the talent. And Kyle Lowry was on the trade block, and everyone's going like, "Okay, we get it. This is going to be a, one of those years. We just got to get through three year rebuild, and then." After Rudy was traded, the team came together and picked it up. And from my knowledge, Tim Lewicki was the one that made the call that said, no, we have to launch this uh, in the spring. And everyone's like, I think that's a really bad idea. Yeah. And he's like, no, no, no. I completely believe we have to launch this now. And then they went, they just soared off of that. And I so think cool. uh, there was a real identity that I was say, formed. It probably gave the team an identity. Yeah, completely. You know, and it sometimes all it takes is a slogan like that or for them to realize that this country is rallying behind them and they are representing more than just themselves and that logo on the front of the jersey that there's a whole country here that's relying on them to represent us properly. So what do you know about stuff like that though? I don't know. Uh, honestly. I feel like I'm just making it up. <laughs> <laughs> what was the will you go back to whether it's the 2010 team or one of the teams where you were, won the world championships with, yeah. what was a common thread through the identity between that group of women? Um, I think everybody just holding each other accountable. I don't yeah. think anybody on the team ever really put up with any BS. And I mean, obviously there were time and there were teammates who um, had themselves maybe plotted above everyone else. Yep. But it's crazy because on that team, you got 21 all-stars. So 21 players who on all of their club teams or on all of their, you know, university teams, they're the captain or Mm -hmm. the assistant captain. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that are on every starting power play. They're on the top line. They're killing every penalty. Every player on the team. Scoring all the goals. All the goals. And landing all the checks. Totally. And so every single player on that team is used to being the person. Right. And you can't have that on an all-star team. There's only going to be one line Mm -hmm. of those people. Two defensemen of those people and one starting goalie. And everyone else has really got to swallow their pride and figure out what's my role? What's my job? What do I have to do? And do it to the best of your ability because, you know, it's – it. I, I realized it in um, – I made the team in 2007 and we won uh, in Winnipeg and – uh, Vicky Sanahara was on the team, Danielle Goyette. Like we had legends still on that team who really laid down a wicked awesome foundation. Cassie Campbell left a, after 2006, really um, passed the torch with a lot of great stuff in place. And, you know, after that, we kind of went on a little bit of a losing skid. And in 2000, we lost in 08 in China. I wasn't on that team, but nonetheless, I still felt like it was my own loss. Mm-hmm. Uh, 2009, before the Olympics, we were playing in Finland at the World Championship, and we had a really good team. There was a line, Jaina Hefford, Hockey Hall of Famer, by the way. Uh, how, uh, how incredible is that? She's so for, wicked. To see your friend. But to be there, I cry, I was crying. I believe you. Balling. Um, Jaina Hefford, Jennifer Botterill at center ice, right? Two-time Patty Kazmaier winner. Harvard Hall of Famer, like this girl's just unbelievable. Carolyn Willett, mm-hmm. captain of Team Canada, just legend in the game, now coaching the national team. She's just a hockey whiz. That line was quite literally unstoppable. Then you had Jillian Apps, Haley Wickenheiser, Sherry Piper. I mean, come on. What do you, right? We're throwing those two lines at you. What are you thinking? Yeah, You're yeah. just like, oh boy. Yeah, and then, you know, it was just everything after that just was uh, we had this amazing group and we went out there and we played so poorly. We played like we deserved that medal before we even stepped right. on the ice and the U.S. took it to us. And I remember sitting in the locker room after that and people were crying and I was still a rookie. I hadn't made an Olympic team yet. I was cut in 05, 06. I had only been on, that was my second world championship team technically. I made 07 and 09 
and people were crying and upset and people were pouty. And I remember being so mad because looking around the room, I could only count one person that knew what it was like to be like me and sit on the couch at home and watch a team play and lose. And knowing full well that you, all you wanted to do was contribute and help them be better and win. And I said, I was like, I don't know why everyone's crying because we played barely good enough for that silver medal. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of people at home right now that didn't get the call to come play on this team that didn't get the call to come try out for the 2010 Olympics. And we did them a huge disservice. And I think we all need to take a long look in the mirror and figure out what the hell we're doing here because our team's way too good. And I, uh, Hef stood up and said something. And when Heffy speaks, let me tell you, everybody is listening. And Wick said something. And I think it was a moment where, uh, Hef actually said, you know, I think, uh, leading, uh, we should all take these silver medals, remember this feeling in this moment and how bad we played. Um, and I think we should hang them in our stalls centralized year leading up to the Olympics. So we remember that the only team that can beat us is ourselves. And I thought that was genius. Mm-hmm. Like that's Jaina Hefford at work right there. Mm-hmm. And keep in mind, she didn't say anything all tournament. That was the one thing she said. So it's like heavy hitting stuff when Heffy opens her mouth. And I was just like, okay, we're going to do this. And from first day of training camp leading up to uh, the Vancouver Olympic Games, it was business, man. We were all just like, we needed that loss. And I think that, you know, you need to learn how to lose in order to learn how to win. And while losing sucks, uh, I think that it teaches you so much more. Like I wouldn't have been the player I was if I didn't get cut in 05 or 08. Um, you know, I our team wouldn't have been able to come back in 2014 if we hadn't lost all of those world championships. Um, I wasn't on that team, but I, I was covering it. And I just think that, you know, there's a lot of great moments that happen within a locker room where it's full of leaders and everybody just knows what they need to take from certain moments and everybody needs to call each other on certain things and just be honest with each other. And that's where that sisterhood or that brotherhood, like you talked about, um, really comes into play and you become that family. And that's why when we win, those celebrations are so unique and so special. And that's why we take them maybe to the next level with a cigar or two or uh, giant size beers or whatever. But, um, yeah. Texas Mickey's next time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just, I think there is something, um, unique about having a locker room full of crazy good athletes and super awesome leaders that, um, draws the best in each other. But I think that sometimes it can get away from itself. You know, a team full of all stars isn't always great that you need to make sure that everybody's checking each other and keeping each other honest. And I think we've seen that on the men's side Huge. On, on and off for years. And I don't want to ever point any fingers because they're all incredible, but you, you really need a group that knows how to work together. Absolutely. Um, Selflessness, I think completely. is huge. Yeah. You brought up Jana going into the hall of fame. Yeah. Incredible. What a long list of women from all these years. And this is just on the Canadian side yeah. that I'm like, yo, you're Haley's not in yet. She'll what, be eligible this summer. Will she this summer? Yeah. I, I was I, I quickly went down the list and I was like, oh, Wick's not in yet. Yeah. I'm like, holy smoke. Cassie's not in. Cassie's not in. The thing with Cassie, everyone's like, oh, her numbers aren't there. I'm like, I don't... Have you ever played a sport where a single person doesn't have to score a goal, but they will decide how your team plays? I'm being serious. It, Cassie Campbell is the only hockey player, male or female, to captain two Canadian teams to two Olympic gold medals. Hmm. Hello. Okay. First of all. Secondly, name me one player that has played with her or against her that will say that she wasn't a game changer. She is. And people are like, she'll go in as a builder. Cassie, yes, that's great. And that's an honor to go in as that. And yes, she is and was a builder. And she will continue to be her entire life because that's just Cassie. She's super awesome and super great. But I don't think that should be taken away from her hockey career. Her hockey career was legendary in itself. And all it would take is for any single person that would argue that to spend one day in a change room with her before a big game. That's all I got to say. So I'm, 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 I should campaign for Cass, Cassie. I think. You should. She's on the selection committee it, now, so isn't that awkward? It, I, I, someone, else, <laughs> someone else brought that up. Yeah. Uh, I, was just, uh, I, I pulled I, Lanny S- aside. Steve, this. Steve Dangle, Steve Glenn, yeah. mutual friend. He brought it up recently on his podcast that he, she's on. So how does she get named when she's on the selection committee? <laughs> I, t- I pulled but Lanny wild. aside at Heffy's Hall of Famer. I was like, listen, I know Jane is in, but like, and I looked at Cassie and I was like, listen, man, you've got work to do. He was like, Tessa, I know. Big announcement coming tomorrow, though. And sure enough, I checked my work phone and 
I'm like, that's, that's not. A, that's not the announcement that's not I'm what talking I, that's about. That's not what I was talking about, Lanny. <laughs> like, come on. Yeah. Get your head of your ass. No. Uh, <laughs> Lanny. Lanny. Lanny's probably one of the greatest guys <laughs> I've ever met. Again, that he's another, that guy, like him, Bobby Orr, those guys just have so much, you know, patient, grace about the way they yeah, fans process. are all over them, tugging at them. Everybody wants Bobby's autograph. He sits down and looks in the eye and talks to you and signs every autograph. It doesn't matter how long that lineup is. It's like these – would you see that nowadays? I, I don't know if you would. I mean I've, I'm sure there's a handful of them out there. Yeah, and I've I've played witness to situations where that are the exact, exact opposite. Yeah. Them, where they look at their watch. They go, oh, my time's up. It doesn't matter how long the line is. No. And they kind of bolt. Uh, funny Bobby Orr story. I, a few years, a few, a lot of years, about a decade ago, I was covering an event on Remembrance Day and yeah. he was there and I asked him for an interview and he's like, to be fair, I don't really want to do any interviews today, but I'd be happy to just talk if you want to talk. And I sat there and spoke to him for 10 minutes. That's so just cool. To, and I was like, okay, this is fair. He doesn't want to whatever. You don't want to be on the record or you don't want to have to go into that mode. Mm-hmm. Um I got to talk to Bobby. That's my dad's hero. Yeah. Where my dad wore number four because of Bobby Orr. Yeah. Uh, and that was like the coolest moment. And that another, uh, just another way that it shows me how you can show someone respect yeah. without necessarily doing something you're uncomfortable He with. could have easily dropped a hard note, turn around on his heels and walked away. And just away. walked out. Yeah. Completely. I've kept you for more time. Really? Than, than I told you I was going to. My parking ran out. I swear to goodness. Did it? No, uh, I, I don't even with, know. Dylan will cover your, yeah. your ticket. Uh, he's got all the Poor money. guy. <laughs> Tess, you have... There's so many things I could get into. We can and have I, some and I fun hope, again. I hope you come back again yeah, so that we can. Anytime. Uh, you have been such an inspiration and such like a, a, a hero. A hero of mine. A hundred percent. Just the way you conduct yourself. Um, just the way you've gone through the sports business and then into the broadcast business. I think there's anyone who meets you could learn so much just from being around you. I think you're incredible. And uh, I hope my check's in the mail. I appreciate that. Yeah. (laughs) I'll drop a 20 before I leave just for all that. (laughs) I I like to finish uh, each podcast the same way because I believe that any change someone wants to make in their life starts with the small things. And so I finish off by saying everyone be good to themselves and then don't forget to eat your vegetables. So if we can... Because it's the small thing. It is. So everyone with that, from myself, Dylan, from Luca, who's cutting the podcast, from Tessa, who's amazing, please, please, please be good to yourself. And eat your vegetables. This is so much fun. (laughs)